Don't freak out. Your Napoli is coming, but it's okay. What's up guys, I'm Katie. I'm a 2019 graduate from the Ontario Veterinary College and I'm here to give you some tips for writing your Napoli. I wrote my Napoli last year, it was extremely stressful and I just wanna help as many students as possible get through it. This video is gonna tell you how to use one simple acronym to answer any question on the Napoli, all right? You only have a certain amount of time to write and there's 360 questions. So being the most methodical and efficient that you can be will be very helpful in passing your exam. So I invented this acronym to help you approach every question on the Navali in the same systematic way because you're going to be surprised with 360 questions that you have never seen before and the one thing that's going to help you is if you approach every question with the same strategy and you go into it with a plan. So I was thinking to myself, what does every case-based question have in common? What components do they have? What are they asking? How can we approach this in a systematic way? And thus, Spock was born. This is an acronym that you can use as a tool and a resource in the days leading up to your Navali and on the day of your exam. So let me tell you what it is, why it works, and how to use it to your advantage. The S in Spock stands for signalment, all right? This is one of the most important parts of the question. It's the first thing you should highlight and also, luckily, is the first thing that the question presents to you. If you completely ignore the signalman and just start analyzing blood work, for example, you are doing yourself a huge disservice, okay? This is the first thing of Spock, this is the first thing you should highlight. The P in Spock stands for problem or presenting complaint, whichever one is easier for you to remember, okay? So all of these questions are being presented to you because there's some sort of problem or issue that's going on and you need to figure out what it is or how to treat it or how to proceed. But the most important thing is, is that every question has this component and it's important to figure out what it is so that you can choose the correct answer choice later on. The O in Spock stands for objective, all right? These are your objective findings. For example, on your physical exam, if you find lymphadenopathy or the heart rate or the rest rate or the temperature is elevated or decreased, you have to know what is normal and what is not normal so that you can figure out what's wrong with the animal. So identifying and highlighting the objective findings is super important when you're trying to answer the question correctly. The last letter in Spock is Q, and that stands for question. The Q might be the most underrated, underestimated, overlooked letter in the entire acronym, okay? You have no idea how many times I would be studying and I would find myself trying to answer a question when I didn't even really know what it was asking, all right? And my friends fell into this trap as well. So please, please, please highlight what the question is. You have to know what it's asking in order to answer the question. All right, so there you have it. That's what Spock is. That's the acronym I came up with. It's sort of all encompassing and I found that all questions have those four things. The first thing you need to do when you see a question and I cannot stress this enough is just remain calm because you're gonna see some that are very, very long and you're gonna think, how am I ever gonna get through this and answer this question, okay? Just stick with the strategy, highlight the important things and everything will be okay. All right, so what we want to do when we see a super long question is read, answer and check. All right, what we do not want to do is panic, click, and cry. So let's get into how to use it and look at some examples. All right, starting off with a two-year-old male neutered domestic short hair cat named Finn presents for a two-month history of coughing with occasional wheezing. He is mildly tachypnic when he is active per owner's observation. Currently, no tachypnea or labored breathing are appreciated. Finn is an indoor cat. Heart and lungs ascult normally. Blood work is unremarkable other than a mild eosinophilia. Heartworm and fecal testing are negative. Chest radiographs reveal a mild interstitial pattern with diffuse bronchial wall thickening. Which diagnosis and therapy would be most appropriate? All right, so the first thing that comes to mind right now is that this is a perfect Spock method candidate, as are most questions that you will see. So let's start some highlighting. All right, gonna highlight the S. So S stands for signalment, right? That's super easy, it's right at the beginning. So two-year-old male neutered domestic short hair named Finn. What a waste of time. I only have so much time, people, and you're gonna waste it using names. The next letter is P, problem, or presenting complaint. So two-month history uh, of coughing with occasional wheezing. That is the problem. That's why the owner came in with the cat today. Um, so he's tachypnic when he's active. So the next part of the acronym is O for objective findings. So you are assessing the cat right now and what do you see? So everything's normal sounding, blood work is unremarkable, um, there's a mild eosinophilia, so those are all objective findings. Heartworm and fecal testing are negative, all right? That's important. From the chest radiographs, you see uh, all this. You already read that, so I'm not gonna repeat it to you. And then the last part is Q, question. Which diagnosis and therapy would be most appropriate? 
So as you can see, this is very helpful because in four short bullet points, we have the signalment, the problem, the objective findings, and the question. So let's look at A. A is pneumonia and a broad spectrum antibiotic. Okay, that's probably quite unlikely because first of all, it's not really chronic. It would be worsening as well. He's not tachypnic in the room and his lungs are skull normally, you know. It's not like the pneumonia was like, shh, we're at the vet. Don't make the cat tachypnic. <laughs> you can cross that off the list. Feline asthma, uh, prednisolone, that sounds, you know, that sounds pretty on point at the moment. Uh, congestive heart failure, furosemide, so that's pretty unlikely in a cat. How old? Oh, you highlighted the signalment, so it's two. Pretty unlikely, uh, as well as there's no heart murmur because the heart and lungs escalate normally. Allerostrongulus, fembendazole, that's unlikely as well because they specifically say the fecal testing um, was negative. Airway collapse from trauma, no treatment indicated. I mean, it's an indoor cat. That's probably less likely. So I think the best answer here is feline asthma and you treat it with prednisolone and that is the correct answer. So that's just an example of using the Spock method really quickly. Um, let's move on to another one. All right, so let's go through this one a little bit faster. Uh, we have a seven year old Holstein cow. Boom, signalment done. Highlight that thing. All right, presents with a two day history of depression, anorexia, fever, circling, right sided head tilt and head pressing. That's the problem. That's why you got called to the farm in the first place, right? So highlight that two day history of all this stuff. And you should in your mind right now be thinking neuro that should be screaming at you in this moment. All right. You identify cranial nerve deficits upon neurologic exam. So this is coming up to your objective findings. This is the O of Spock, right? Right ear is drooping, right eye appears dropped and she's drooling from the right side of her mouth. So you can highlight that ear drooping, eyes dropped and uh, drooling. All right, so that's the O. The Q is what is the most likely diagnosis? So that's what the actual question is asking. So let's look at the answers here. So A, polioencephalomalacia. That does cause neuroscience, but not the ones that we're seeing here. That causes more like blindness, seizures, coma, um, depression, stuff like that, but not really cranial nerve deficits. Perennial ryegrass daggers doesn't really cause cranial nerve deficits like we're seeing in the question here. It's more like ataxia. All right, so C, listeriosis. So listeriosis definitely causes cranial nerve deficits, especially one-sided. So hold that thought and we'll read answer D. So D is mycoplasma bovis, which does not cause cranial nerve deficits either. So I think our best bet here is listeriosis, which is the correct answer. So there we go. Boom, Spock, done. All right, one more just to drive home the usefulness of the Spock method. All right, here we go. A seven-year-old female beagle. Highlight that thing, that's the signalment. Presents to you for lethargy and inappetence. Boom, problem. On your exam, you detect mandibular lymphadenopathy. That's the objective findings, the O, and you perform a finding of the aspirate, cool. You see the depicted aspirate depicted here. Did I just say depicted twice? You just, you, de you depicted. You see the aspirate depicted here. This is also part of your objective findings, all right? So we look at the image and we diagnose a raging lymphoma, very sad. Q, which of these treatments would be given to this patient as part of first line therapy? All right, so carboplatin, a chemotherapeutic drug. That's, I mean, that's fair. I think we should read them all. Milbamycin, no, that's an antiparasitic. Itraconazole, no, that's an antifungal. Prednisone, an immunosuppressive drug, that's good. Um, or doxycycline, that's an antibiotic. So we've narrowed it down to two. That's why Spock is so useful. Let's read the question. Which of these treatments would be given to this patient as part of a first line therapy? Okay, so carboplatin may be a chemotherapeutic drug, but it is not first line, okay? Prednisone is a first line therapy. So because the question asked for first line therapy, prednisone is the best answer here, and that's the correct answer. See, spocked. So I hope that made sense, and I hope I convinced you that this is a good method to use as you prepare for the NABLI as well as during the test itself. So I hope this video was helpful. I hope Spock serves you well. If you're ever feeling stressed out, just remember my face saying that you can do this. Remember Spock. Remember my face on Spock's face. Whatever you need to do to pass the NABLI, okay? I want you to pass, and I know that you can, all right? So if you have any questions or comments about this video, please post them below and I'll get to them as soon as I can. Good luck with studying. Please let me know how it's going and if this method is working for you and I'll see you in the next video.